yeah. Uh, alrighty. So um, I'm Andrea, as I mentioned. I'm the author of four books. The most recent, which I should have brought a copy of, and I did not. Sorry, I was busy in the garden before this. Um, it's called Like a Boy But Not a Boy. It's a book of essays um, that's out with Arsenal Pulp Press. And it was named one of CBC's top nonfiction books of 2020. Um, I'm a National Magazine Warner winner in the essays category, and I've been editing professionally for magazines, book publishers, and most recently an online news magazine uh, for the past 10 years. Um, I'm currently writing a memoir about food and mental illness. Um, I thought that it was going to be a book of essays, and it turns out that it's going to be a memoir. So we're all learning all the time. Um, yeah. So I'm hoping that this workshop will be helpful for people who are coming to memoir with a range of different skill levels. I only said the sort of like fancy part of my bio so that you know where I'm coming from and why I'm giving you advice, <laughs> like where I'm, where I'm situated and why I have opinions about these things. Um, so yeah, I'm hoping to just do a go around at first to, if you could share a little bit about yourself and maybe what you're hoping to get out of the workshop. And if you feel like it, just like a little bit about um, yeah, why you want to write memoir or what your memoir writing experience is. Um, does anyone feel like starting? <laughs> if not, we'll just go around the circle and I will choose someone to go first. Okay, um, why don't we start with you, Anna? Sure. Hi, everybody. I'm Annie and um, happy to be here. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. So I just moved up here a couple months ago from Vancouver. And um, in Vancouver, I was going to school at a little bar. I was working as a art teacher for kids um, at a daycare. And yeah, and then I found myself up here recently. And currently my practice, I've been making um, books. <laughs> um, they're, uh, kind of mixed media illustration books, um, and they're pretty autobiographical. Um, <clears throat> I've been doing a series about fake cowboys in the city, and my most recent book that I've been storyboarding for um, is about fake cowgirls, and it tells the story between my friend and I, and art school has turned into the stables and all the artists in the school are cowboys and cowgirls <laughs> and so yeah it's pretty satirical and that's kind of like been an ongoing theme um but yeah in the in the previous books sort of what i've done is just i've written songs um and they're kind of like song books um and yeah so i'm just been playing with that um definitely all the writing I do is uh definitely more in the in the creative sphere um and very loose structured so I'm just coming here with a very open mind and cool. it's a willingness to yeah learn learn and experiment with my writing awesome so really happy to be here cool thanks for coming sorry I said Anna instead of Annie that's okay <laughs> I'm interested in the topic. I like this writing. I have no other plans besides visual <laughs> arts, but I do uh, animation as well. So, storyboarding is this part from the so interesting to look at that in the memoir. Part of the 
process. I left some space at the end, depending on like how long everything takes um, to to do that like sharing part. But um, but there are actually like copyright questions around that. Yeah, stop. So maybe we'll just stop the recording at that point. Yeah, and then sometimes it's yeah you don't always necessarily want everything to be public before you're ready to share it. So um, that is a very good point. Thank you for raising that. Um, yes. Yeah. I am my mostly write have been writing songs and I also have written a children's book that I'm producing uh, in line in the home. And uh, I've been taking part in a few of the groups at the library has offered with name goals. Uh, she has a sure she has been doing it. a Friday afternoon by And this was the queer pride writing event, and I wanted to. I've never done any sort of autobiographical. Uh, yeah. It's kind of dumb. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I hear that. Um, do you mind sharing why you, what you find don what you find daunting what about I find it? Daunting about well, like I guess off the top of my head. I wouldn't have a clue what to write about. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, like, what part of your life do you want to talk about? Or when do you write? It's like, oh, well, I can't write that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, I guess just being, just, I think what's daunting for me is choosing what to write like what are you going to make public yeah and uh how are you going to write it like i just want to be like, pathetic mm. <laughs> yeah i hear that those are all very common yeah that's a very natural set of concerns to have um and we'll talk a little bit about some of that um but then also we can maybe talk about the sense, like sharing sensitive stuff or deciding what's private and what's public. If people want to talk about that. Um, Kate, do you want to? Sure. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, can good. I Thanks, Andrea. And uh, yeah, I wish I was out there in Powell River with everyone, but uh, yeah, I have a good excuse, COVID. So um, otherwise I would love to be out there and see the art show in person. Um, I haven't done a memoir, but I did do a, a kid's book. So I illustrated and wrote a kid's book and it is somewhat autobiographical. It's about a little girl who wants to do ballet, but she's not really all that gifted and she keeps falling over, et cetera, which is pretty much like me. And that would be dead on actually. And she finds out she loves art. So in a way it's a bit uh, autobiographical, I suppose. Um, but I'm open to, I don't have any specific ideas for memoirs, but I find them really interesting. And I've always been drawn to like graphic novels that are memoirs, yeah. specifically people like Alison Bechdel, like yeah. Fun Home and that kind of thing. I just love, love, love. So yeah, I'm happy to be here, even though it's Zoom. And I'm very open to mem memoir ideas, uh, especially thinking along the lines of like graphic novels. 
And uh, yeah, thanks, Andrea. Yeah, of the- course. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Um, yeah, I guess uh, what I'm mostly going to be talking about today is like like text based autobiography, autobiography or memoir or personal essay. But there are elements often of um, life experience uh, that crop up in graphic novel, in song writing, um, in poetry. And so some of this stuff will be applicable across genres, but then there is some flexibility in some of those genres for um, whether or not everything 100% happened the way you described it. Graphic novel is actually an interesting boundary case um, because I would say someone like Bechdel, you would expect all of her work to be something that happened in life. Um, I don't know. Yeah, it's all about reader expectation. Okay, so um, thanks for telling me your names and a little bit about why you're here. Um, So I wanted to start with a writing exercise um, so that we can kind of practice um, some of the stuff I'm gonna be talking about in terms of like uh, getting like detail into writing. So um, I'm gonna ask you to take 10 minutes and I'll put 10 minutes on my phone. Um, Does everyone, yeah, everyone has paper and pencil proof. And I just want you to write a scene from your life. It can be an important pivotal scene. It could be something that's totally autobiographical, or if you want to use this as an experience, uh, as as an opportunity to write a scene from something you're looking to write that uses your experiences, but isn't autobiographical in that way, you can do that too. Um, But just, uh, yeah, just like a scene. So um, a pivotal moment for me, for example, that I wrote about in my book was the act of, telling my family when I was pregnant that being trans and non-binary meant that I did not want them to refer to me as mom like ever. Um, And it felt like a coming out moment, like, but one in like a series of coming out moments. Um, And it happened when we were on a vacation together and we were at a restaurant and I was hangry and we were waiting for nachos to arrive. (laughs) So that that would be like a scene that I would potentially write if I was gonna do this. Um, If there's too much pressure, you could just pick something that happened to you like this week. It doesn't really matter. It can be a low, low, low barrier type of thing. Um, So you don't have any questions before we start? It's not, you won't have to share it if you don't feel like it. Okay, I'm gonna put 10 minutes on my timer. Here we go.
Okay, timer is up. I don't know if that felt like a short time or a long time, or maybe a bit of both. both. <laughs> long at the beginning and then short at the end. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sort of always how it works. Um, Okay, so thank you for doing that. Um, now we're gonna dig a little deeper into what you wrote using something called the Schwartz technique. Um, this is a technique I learned about that has to do with, or that comes from documentary filmmaking. And it's specifically something you can use when you're interviewing someone about an experience that they had and you're trying to recreate that moment but um, it's a technique you can also use on yourself. Um, not everybody thinks this way, but a lot of people think in, in sequences of visual images. We have a lot of artists here, so I'm assuming that you probably do. Um, other people have different ways of remembering, but, but visual memory is something that is pretty common anyway. So um, you can take bullet point notes for this part and then part of the idea is, is that you might take these bullet point notes and rewrite the scene that you've just written later on using these details that you've elicited from yourself. Um, a huge part of writing is editing or rewriting, like completely scrapping a first draft and starting again. Um, and so that's another aspect of uh, writing that this exercise gets at a little bit. So um, when you think about the scene that you just wrote, um, I want you to see if you can see it as a sequence of images in your mind. Um, and I want you to see like, is there a specific moment from that scene that really, really, really encapsulates it for you, the whole thing, um, like a very specific moment. So, um, when I was talking about that like nacho scene, for example, um, I remember being across the table from my brother and uh, floating across this one like alternative parent term as I was like playing with a napkin and he made fun of it immediately. <laughs> and that, that's the moment that like encapsulates that whole scene for me. Um, this moment's usually pretty short and you should be able to vis visualize it. So the next step of this is, what's the first clear picture in your mind as you relive that moment? Um, and I want you to take a second just to jot some notes down. Um, and instead of, uh, I remember my brother tilted his head back and laughed, I would just write down, my brother tilted his head back and laughed. So cut out the buffer language. Um, but yeah, if you want to just jot one thing down, I'll give you a few minutes to decide what that is. Not a few minutes, actually, just like a minute. A visual thing? Yeah, a visual thing. Yeah, something visual. Can I make it up so I don't remember? For the purposes of the exercise, yes. In general, no. And if you're writing, if you're writing. If you're writing something you're going to share as autobiography with people, then then everything should have happened. Um, people have different memories of, of any given event, but typically you don't put in invented detail. If you're writing a song, though, or some like there are different genres have different rules. But for the purposes of this exercise, yes, sure. <laughs> okay. If you have a, if your memory works in, in like sound or smell or like texture or something different, you could also write that sensation instead of the visual part. Although, a remembering, a reaction to something that someone's, my reaction or. Sure, yeah, um, yeah.
है And then next, I want you to write the, there usually will be like, like maybe five images in a row that should come up for you potentially. Um, so the next step is to write that second clear image. Um, what smaller details do you remember? Do you remember a smell or a sound, um, something, yeah. Something from your senses. And then um, is there a third clear picture? Is there anything striking about the setting that you were in that you could mention? And then um, what's the fourth clear picture? Um, what's the next action that happened in that moment? And the fifth clear picture, is there a facial expression you can describe? Is there something that happened that evoked a feeling in you? Um, what was the feeling? Can you describe it? And then finally, is there a sixth clear picture? Are there any other details that have been, that have come up for you or that have been evoked that you'd like to jot down? Um, yeah. This will be the last step, I promise.
So you should have your original scene and you should have a bunch of imagistic notes that evoke some details. Um, so I'm sort of curious, like how different is your first scene than the details you wrote down next? I guess no one has to answer that. If you want to answer, is there a difference between what you wrote first and, and the, the detail you elicited? Yeah. Much more yeah. Okay. Awesome. Um, yeah, it, uh, it's hard to learn how to write that detail at first. And so this is a technique I use on myself to draw it out. And it's a technique that I learned from interviewing other people and trying to picture the scene that they were setting for me so that I could write it for other people. And it's now a technique I use on myself when I'm writing personal essay or memoir or uh, when I have to be in a piece in order to uh, describe the experience of, of uh, what I wanna share with others. Um, so the next step for this exercise, and I won't make you do it right now, is to set aside the first scene that you wrote completely, like just set it aside and then rewrite it a second time using all that detail you pulled out of yourself. Um, and you can also, like the next time you read a magazine article or a personal essay, something that opens and seen, you can kind of pay attention to it with that, not the reading part of your brain, but the analytical part of your brain and see what details uh, are being shared that are setting the scene. And then if you start writing, reading magazine articles like that, you'll start sort of, your brain will pick up on what, what you need to be looking at and noting down and mentioning so that you can re-evoke, uh, so that you can evoke that scene setting and opening for other people in your own writing, if that's something you wanna do. Um, but yeah. The goal is always for me to make something clear and vivid for a reader so that they can really see it in their minds and be there with you as you're describing it happening. Yeah, does anyone have any questions before we move on? Um, in fiction, often you can start in notes, and then you can start yeah. more anywhere. But in one more, it seems to be more common. Uh, it depends. Yeah. So I think that the way that the way I'll probably write my food memoir is to start in the middle with the first chapter or the intro and then rewind for the second chapter. So that is also a comment and then you can go in a linear way. But yeah, you are right that people often prefer linearity in, in memoir and autobiography. If you're writing personal essay, we don't have a whiteboard, do we? Um, uh, I can, I think I can do it on the back of my blank sheet here. Oh. Okay, I'll do it on my notebook. So, um, theme, personal experience. Um, the way that I think about, so if there are two lines and one of them is like theme and one of them is personal experience, the way that I think about memoir is that you're in personal experience a lot and then you can dip into theme as you go. So like you're staying in mem or personal experience a lot, and but, but then you will stand back and say like how this personal experience ties into how we think about sustenance or nourishment or um, queer family making, whatever it is that you're that you're writing about. Because usually when you're writing memoir, it's touching on thematic things that are so, but then when I'm thinking about personal essay, I'm thinking I'm staying in theme for a bunch and then I'm dipping into personal experience when it gives me something I can share about theme. So that's the way I think about those two things. I don't some of that might be familiar to some of you and but anyway they're they're related personal personal essay and memoir but they do tend to be a bit different so for personal essay it doesn't have to be chronological at all um because that theme part of it is leading and you're dipping into your personal experience when you need it in order in service of the theme and you can write a non-linear memoir yeah you can experiment as much as you want but Probably if you're starting out, it's a good idea to have a good sense of how to write a story that, in a beginning, middle, end type of way. 
and then you can kind of figure out how you want to play around with it after that. That was a convoluted answer, I guess, to your question. But <laughs> um, um, does anyone else have any questions? Okay. If you have one later on, just let me know. So um, I do want to talk a bit about publishing, just in case anyone's interested in that. But before that, um, this memoir, the theme of the show this year is, is the self in flux. So I want to talk a little bit about that, how to write the self when the self is in flux. I want to talk a little bit about research techniques in memoir. And then I want to talk about scenic time versus narrative time. Um, so writing the self and the self is in flux. Um, so this is something I think LGBTQ plus folks think about maybe more than the general public. Um, because when we realize we're queer, there's often a process of becoming that occurs that has to do with gender or sexuality. Um, for my last book, I interviewed a lot of older queer millennials. Um, and a lot of us felt like uh, our adolescence came maybe like a little bit later than our peers, like because teenage life was not a time of comfortable experimentation. Um, we often didn't come out until a little later. And then, so we had that sort of experience in our twenties that a lot of our peers maybe had in their teenage years. And also um, most of the people I talked to said that when they realized they were queer, they also didn't um, feel like their lives are necessarily gonna follow the same paths. So I talked to a lot of people from small towns. So there wasn't that same set of assumptions, like I'm going to get married, buy a house, have a kid type of thing. Like as soon as one of those things was in flux, it was like, all right, well, how do I create the life that I wanna lead anyway? Um, so there's a process of like becoming that maybe takes longer to figure out our life paths, where we fit in society. And um, yeah, some of the people I spoke with too, just decided like their lives would be in flux for their whole lives. And that's also fine to decide that there isn't, you know, a set path or set way of being. Um, this can come up in the realm of sexuality, can come up in gender, can come up in, in like moving through life stages, building chosen families, renegotiating relationships with biological families, stuff like that. Um, and I think it's really common when you're figuring out how to write memoir, um, how to draw the parameters on your story, because every single person is a very like complex individual full of lots of different like contradictions and life experiences. And, and um, you know, if you're thinking in terms of themes, many, many themes. Um, so uh, what do I mean by that? So in my essay book, um, I'm non-binary, I'm bipolar. And for a long time, I was pretty broke. So I wanted to write a piece, if I wanted to write a piece about, um, being pregnant or parenting, for example, all three of those things felt super important. And it felt difficult to tell a coherent story without it becoming too complicated. So what I chose to do was write several different essays. So I wrote a piece about parenting as a freelancer in Canada, where I mentioned, but didn't spend a ton of time on my gender and mental health. Um, I wrote a piece about being bipolar in which I talked about pregnancy and gender. And then I wrote a few pieces about gender and parenting in which I mentioned being bipolar and broke. So um, in each of these things, I chose like a focus for the piece um, and it, I didn't erase the other parts of myself. Like I let them come up when they were relevant, but I kind of like reined them in because I decided to dedicate that particular slice to, um, to a given theme that I wanted to talk about. Um, and I felt comfortable doing that because I knew I could write other things that would speak to different aspects of my experience. Um, and that's like a lesson of memoir writing. You have a lot of stories to tell and you don't need to cram every part of your life or every part of you into each and every story. Um, again, like you don't want to erase yourself as you write the story. It's just that you don't necess necessarily need to explain every single part of yourself uh, in each and every piece. Um, you're a complicated person with a lot of moving parts and no one story can contain that. 
So that's one way of, of figuring out how to write through complexity is um, narrowing in your focus and, um, and understanding that not every story has to fulfill every, tick every single box of your life. Um, another option is to purposefully write through that flux. So you could craft a narrative that you envision in sections, for example, and each section represents a different part of yourself that you're exploring. Um, so this is just a really simple example, but if you're gender fluid, it could be a memoir where each section is a different gender expression. Um, each section could be written in a different style. Um, that would be kind of like in the experimental realm. And yeah, the idea is just to sort of play around with it to figure out what works. Um, and then I also think it's probably important to say that, that you don't owe anyone coherence. Like you as a person don't have to like make sense to anyone. Um, but uh, yeah, when you're writing something you're hoping to share with an audience, or that you're hoping to get published, it's good to ask the question of who your audience is and who you're writing for and what you're hoping to share with them. Um, in writing the story, what do you want your audience to get out of it? Um, yeah, are you hoping that someone will see themselves represented in your writing? Are you hoping that um, something that you're sharing will uh, like provoke a, a thought shift in someone. Um, yeah. So you don't necessarily have to approach the writing with that set of questions. That's maybe something to ask after you write your first draft. If you feel like kind of called to write about something, then after your first draft, you can kind of think like, oh, why did I write that? What am I hoping to put out into the world? And then those questions can help guide a rewrite to get you there. Um, hmm. Anyone have any questions about that? Hmm. Well, all right. So um, research techniques in memoir. Um, as a writer, your job is to convey the truth in good faith. Um, being that most people don't record or document every moment of their lives, uh, I guess some people do now, <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah, uh, there's a certain amount of reconstruction that goes into memoir. I was just thinking about how Paris Hilton has a cooking show now, anyway, and how much of her, a lot of her life is on tape, anyway, um, sorry. If you're not Paris Hilton, you're probably gonna have to reconstruct a bunch of the stuff you want to write about. Um, so uh, when you're reconstructing things, you're relying on your memory. And some of you probably already know this, but um, like an interesting thing about memory is that, um, oh, what is it? It's just an A, adrenaline. Adrenaline is linked to memory formation and um, is one reason why we have an easier time remembering things that were acutely terrible than, than, than things that were positive. So, um, and it's apparently linked to like, uh, just a biological urge to survive. So we're supposed to remember the awful things so that we can like avoid that thing later and not die. But, uh, anyway, so, um, so you might have sharper images in your mind from, from bad things that have happened than, than positive things. Um, anyway, there's a lot of interesting stuff about memory that you can read about if you're so uh, interested. Um, but there, the other thing I think about is the difference between figurative truth and literal truth. So literal truth would be I mean, a lot of COVID related stuff has brought this up. Actually, I saw someone post on a local message board that, that only 2.5% of the global population had had COVID or has COVID. And, and um, so that's a stat, that's truth. But that person who posted felt like it meant that that, that, wasn't, that, that wasn't a lot of people like, 
oh, only 2.5%. Whereas when I saw 2.5%, that's 2.5% of 7 billion people. Like that is a lot of people. Um, and, and, and there's your figurative truth. <laughs> so um, yeah, uh, what feels true and um, like the emotional truth of something versus um, yeah, the actual X, Y, Z of something that happened. And, and actually the figurative truth, like the emotional experience of something will uh, affect the way you remember it to the extent that people, different people in the same room will place emphasis on different things and have different feelings associated with something that happened. So um, yeah, something to think about. Um, if you're publishing in a magazine situation, like if you are gonna have a piece published by the walrus, they will fact check it, even, even if it's a memoir. So um, the fact checking experience involves, uh, it can involve a lot of different stuff, but oftentimes with memoir, the fact checker will wanna to speak to someone else who is there if possible and ask them for their experience of the event. Um, there are other ways to fact check details uh, if you have pictures or if you have a diary or a journal from the time, those are other ways to fact check. Um, and, you know, there are lots of different experiences or examples of, of memoir gone awry in pop culture. So an old, old example now, I guess, is James Frey's A Million Little Pieces, where he sort of embellished and made up some things. And it was an open book cup look. And when people found out that he had embellished, uh, his readers felt like we were really betrayed. So um, yeah, that's another thing to keep in mind. If you're writing in a genre that is kind of like a boundary genre where th there is like some acceptability in terms of embellishing or making up details, you just want to make sure you're flagging that to, their, to the readers so that they don't later feel betrayed that they thought that every single thing happened the way that you described it. Um, so um, yeah, so when it comes to the researching memoir, um, there are a few different ways you can go about doing it. But one thing you can do that feels terrifying at first is to talk to other people who are there. So especially if you're writing about family, that can feel tricky. And I have interviewed my family members before, like in a formal way. My grand, I particularly done with this, this with my grandparents, but I've also just like chatted with my sibling over text or my dad or whoever in a way less formal way. Um, and sometimes it elicits interesting details that I had forgotten about because my memory placed emphasis on a different thing. Um, the other thing about chatting with your family or friends or whoever was there in that way, you can kind of like, that's a gentle way of let, letting them know that you're writing about something and, and getting their participation at the ground level so that it doesn't feel like a surprise later, which is a thing in memoir that can crop up. Um, yeah. Uh, and you can write it into your piece too, if you want. If you're, let's say it's a family piece and your sibling has like a totally different recollection of the event, you can mention that. Um, uh, as an aside or just kind of build it in. Um, and that helps build like for similitude and trust with your reader also. Um, yeah, I think, let's see who does, David Sedaris does that uh, a lot, like stages disagreements with his writing about something or his memory of something like literally in the text from different siblings. Does he have, complicated family relationship, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so yeah, um, secondary research. So when I was writing about being pregnant and bipolar, there were other sources I drew from. Um, I had watched a documentary by Stephen Fry or that, or that starred Stephen Fry. He had two, um, anyway, uh, so, I had remembered that when I was writing about it and I went and rewatched it. Um, and there are also there, I just like looked up journal articles and stuff. So you can do secondary research. Um, 
And then if it's something that happened like a while ago or even last year, you can look up stuff like weather reports and news reports from the time um, to see if you're, if you're scene setting and you remember the day as being like hot and sunny, you can actually like use the weather, the weather network to like go and check that day and make sure that your memory is accurate. Um, or you might find out something interesting. Like, uh, yeah, sometimes something, you'll have like an inkling in the back of your brain and decide to go and look up some newspaper articles and then get some really amazing details when you go and look those articles up. Um, and then for family stuff, ancestry and archival research can also be uh, helpful and sometimes fun and sometimes awful and etc. There's so many pieces that have been published recently about people finding out they're not biologically related to people who they thought they're biologically related to because they sent their DNA into ancestry.com. Um, anyway, so um, it's sometimes helpful to write a first draft and then and then that'll help you figure out where your research gaps are. So you know you want to write about something. You write your scene. Um, maybe you do that exercise with yourself of trying to elicit detail. And then you kind of hit a wall and you're, you're like, oh, I really wish I could remember the shape of that room. Or like, I remember the walls as having an ornate wallpaper, but it's a really fuzzy memory. Maybe you can go back and visit that place. Maybe you can talk to someone else who was there and they remember that it was like dual lame swirls. I don't know. Um, identify the gaps and then do some brainstorming about how to fill them in. Um, yeah, uh, I guess, yeah, if you're writing about health stuff, another thing that's helpful to know is that you can always ask your doctor or whoever for your own records. There are lots of ways of getting information that you can use journalistic techniques to get, um, even if you're not writing journalism and it'll help make your story richer. All right, anyone have any questions about research techniques? Well, how do you decide what research you need to do? Like when you say looking for gaps in your research, like. I'm the worst of people. Like I don't really know how to research. So, mm -hmm. um, so I always write kind of first draft thing for, <laughs> for not for fiction things. Um, so, how do you decide what is the research direction to go, or is it just going to kind of be obvious, or just some? what's important and what's not important yeah. in terms of the periphery. Yeah, that's a really good question. So you do have to figure out what details are important and what details are extraneous. So um, usually when you, it, I feel like these are, the, it's a set of skills you have to hone and practice. Mm -hmm. But um, I think when you're, when you're when you're starting out it's a little bit about that instinct and also thinking about okay when someone reads this what do i want them to come away from it with and i think you have to yeah i think you have to write your first draft first and then you have to get to a point when you're where you're able to be objective about that first draft or you can have a second reader and that could be like a mentor you're working with or it could be like a friend where you read each other's stories and give each other feedback. Um, and you could ask them for specific feedback. Um, when you read my piece, what do you wish I told you more about? Or what aspects of this make you curious? Um, what aspects are you drawn to? Do you look at the theme for that? Yeah, you can look at the theme. You can say like, okay, I'm writing about, um, I'm writing about like family reunification uh, after estrangement or something like that. And then it's kind of like, okay, what moments in the piece really speak to that? Um, if I was reading this in a magazine, what would I expect to see? What are, what are the questions I have after my first draft? And then it's kind of like, 
figuring out what information you need will drive your research techniques. Um, when you're learning how to research, you can go to the library actually and talk to like a, they have research librarians at the library. You can ask them a question like, okay, I wanna know this. Is there a way to figure that out? And their whole job is like figuring stuff out. So um, they will be able to walk you through it. Research librarians are great. Um, yeah, so I mentioned like I've been working as a writer and editor for like 10 years, over 10 years now. And, and even now, so I work at the TAI uh, and yeah, a lot of the times we're doing like knowledge sharing, information sharing about how to get data we need or speak to someone we want to speak to. So it is a, no one has all of the answers. Well, I guess that whatever you decide just shapes your work in that direction. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yes. Um, and then, yeah, sometimes you hit a wall too. Like sometimes there's information that you want that you won't be able to get for whatever reason. And then there are ways of writing around that or writing through it, but yeah. Um, yeah, I just, I like to talk about this stuff in workshops because I think a lot of the time when people write memoir, they're thinking that everything that ends up the, on the page has to be something that's like immediately contained within them. And that's just not, that's not the case. There are lots of ways to get information that aren't from you. And it can be a process rather than, yeah, um, that's sort of like, I had one teacher who described it as like one hot pour. That's sometimes how you get a piece. One hot pour, like, like tea. Um, but other times it's like making soup and to extend his metaphor. <laughs> I don't know. Um, yeah, sometimes a piece just comes out of you, but a lot of times it's not like that at all. You have to gather your ingredients and prepare them and yada, yada. Um, anyone have any other questions? Uh, do we need to get a halfway break? Is everyone kind of, is everyone good to keep going or? Okay, cool. All right. Um, so next thing I'm going to talk about narrative time versus scenic time. Um, this can also be described as uh, scene versus exposition. Um, every sentence in a story is either scene or exposition. Um, it's good to aim for a balance of the two. If you have too much exposition, things get boring. Um, if you have too much scene, the story end up might feel, might end up feeling too long, um, and it might feel like there's no narrative presence that's like guiding the story. Um, when necessary, you can flip scene to exposition, and you can flip exposition to scene. So um, I generally think of a story in chunks. So chunks of scene and chunks of exposition. Scene is active and specific and exposition is general, abstract, recurring, descriptive. Um, exposition might have like some, some linguistic hints for that or, or, or words like usually, used to, remembered, thought, knew. So I'll give some examples. You just go back. You said scene is active and specific, and exposition is general and abstract, recurring, and descriptive. I can also send my notes out later on this stuff. Yeah, if that would be helpful. If we have a way of doing that, yeah. Um, okay, so I'll give some examples. So exposition, my grandfather taught me how to fix things around the house. That's exposition. Um, scene, my grandfather handed me a lamp, a wrench, and a length of wire. You're going to learn to fix this today, he said. So see the difference? Yeah. Exposition, Amy was selfish as a child. Scene, 
When Amy was six, she stole half my Halloween candy. When she was nine, she broke my favorite Barbie, wait, Barney tape, sorry. Um, it's like Barbie, I don't think. Barney tape after our dad gave her a timeout. When she turned 20, she stole my boyfriend. These are not, these are not from my life at all. I don't have a sister. Um, my grandfather did teach me how to rewire a lamp. Um, anyway, exposition. We used to go skating at Coronation Park Arena. Scene. The air at Coronation Park was cold, smelled vaguely of chemicals and sweat. I sat at my favorite place in the bleachers and pulled my skates on. So does that sort of make sense? The examples always make, thing, make things make sense for me. Um, so you can kind of, you can summarize an entire scene in one sentence of exposition if you need to. Um, and then by contrast, you can take a few sentences of exposition and turn them into a scene. Um, when we worked on the writing exercise earlier, I was trying to get you to work in scenic time um, because this is the mode that people tend to struggle uh, with the most, like struggle to get into that scenic mode. Um, and that's why you'll hear in writing workshops, uh, you'll hear instructors say like, show, don't tell. And that's what they, that's what they mean by that. Um, and so you can turn a bit of an analytic lens on your own writing to kind of see like, okay, what am I doing here? Is it specific? Like, am I writing it in scene or am I writing it as exposition? Um, as I mentioned earlier though, it's not that exposition is bad. It's just figuring out how to modulate between the two. And this is something that comes in in editing also rereading your work and turning on that analytic lens and getting a sense of like, okay, too much of this is in scene or too much of this is an exposition. That's the first step. And then the second step is, okay, what do I need to turn from scene to exposition? Or what do I need to turn from exposition to scene? Um, yeah, this is something that takes a long time to work on and perfect. Um, and when I'm editing pieces today by, uh, professional journalists, it's something I, it's an editorial note I give frequently, <laughs> so, but yeah, um, something to think about when writing memoir. Uh, anyone have any questions about that? If you're, if you're a visual artist, uh, you're probably used to thinking in, in images all the time. So, so, so it should come easier to you. Um, uh, yeah. Should we talk about publishing a bit? Okay. Is, um, is anyone hoping to publish something? Okay. Some folks in the room. Um, okay, so I have five. Um, a handout. I will, um, oh, I guess I could have started it in two ways, but, um, and then Kate, if you want to share your email address in the chat, sure. I can send okay. you the, okay, I'll just, um, take a picture or I'll write it down actually. And then I can send you the um, handout later. Okay, great. Thanks, Andrea. Yeah, you're welcome. I do have a question. Yeah. It's not related exactly to, I think where you're heading, but it's, it's something I've always been curious about with people that write memoirs because I think a lot of memoirs that I've read in my mind, take a fair bit of courage. So for example, like I'm an extrovert, however, I would consider myself to be somewhat private. Mm -hmm. So if I were to write a memoir and say it had themes of um, queer and maybe, although it isn't my, so just, just in the, as an example, maybe addiction or mental illness or something like that, um, is there any like preparation that you do for that being published? Cause it's very, for a lot of people, I think it's private. I love reading other people's experiences because yeah. I think we all connect that way. 
but have you ever had examples of people where it sort of it sort of hasn't uh, how do I say that there might be some criticism or the opposite. You probably have experiences where people come up to you and go, oh, wow, you know, me too. Yeah, um, yes. Yeah, those are good questions. Um, those are all considerations when you're writing and sharing memoir. Um, the type of memoir that people like to read oftentimes um, is memoir that feels like someone is sharing something that that feels difficult to share. Um, uh, I think people experience moments of connection in vulnerability a lot of times. That means uh, as a writer, you're sharing something that's super vulnerable. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yeah, that can be difficult. It can be something that maybe you don't want to do uh, ultimately. <laughs> Um, and, or, or it can be something that you do want to do. Um, the, <laughs> and then also there is the, uh, the like relationships part of it, um, figuring out if you want to get consent or need to get consent from someone. Um, if you're writing about your own story, there are often other people in it. Um, or, you know, if you're writing about mental health or addiction, um, those things are often related back to trauma. And so if you are writing about the trauma, then, you know, there might be someone implicated in that. Um, and there are different things to think about. So there's the relational aspect of it. Like if I write about this particular time in my life that involves this particular person, um, are they going to be upset about it? And if they're going to be upset about it, um, how do I want to handle that? Do I want to have a conversation with them first? What do I want to do? Um, if they say, I don't want you talking about that, how do I feel about it? Um, and then there's actually like even the legal aspect of, of, of it. Like um, occasionally people get sued <laughs> when, they, mm -hmm. when they publish a memoir. Um, let's see who's gotten sued. Um, Oh, uh, Evelyn Lau, I believe yeah. she got sued. Uh, she wrote about her relationship with an older, yeah, Warren, yeah, Warren Kinsella. Uh, and they had a dramatic and crappy relationship and he was much, much older than her. And she wrote a memoir uh, telling her truth about that and he sued her. And so those all got pulped and I don't know, <laughs> you know what the monitor, he won. Yeah. Um, and then uh, lately, like recently in the past five years or so, um, a lot of people who in Canada in particular, because the libel laws are different in Canada and the U S and the UK, whatever. So thinking about where you're writing impacts the legal aspect of this stuff, but um, people who have written about um, experiences of sexual assault have been sued a bunch. Um, so something to think about. You can always get a legal read in journalism. That happens frequently. It also means that in some situations, um, it is legally safer to be a source for a story than to write your own story. These are huge, complicated questions that I wasn't <laughs> getting into today, but if anyone's writing about that stuff, we can totally talk about it. But um, but yeah, so it's stuff to think about. Um, I can share in a, a specific example from my life, which is that um, uh, one of the first nonfiction pieces I ever had published um, uh, my mother is an alcoholic and I wrote a piece about Mother's Day, like what, what it's like, what Mother's Day is like when you have a complicated relationship with your mom. Um, and I, it was a scene from a Mother's Day at her house. And we had a really um, strained relationship at that point. Uh, but when I published the piece, I didn't think she would ever see it. But somebody three years after I published it, shared it on Facebook and she saw it and then she stopped talking to me forever. <laughs> so um, that would probably be like the, um, 
I think that's the thing that people worry about the most. Like that's maybe the worst case. No, the worst case scenario is being sued. The second worst case scenario is that sort of shock and estrangement um, or anger, like strong emotional feeling um, from someone that you have written about. Or in my case, like I wanted to write about my experience, but I couldn't write about my experience without talking about that relationship. Um, uh, and, And where I landed was that actually it was a real relief to be estranged from her. And so I don't regret it. I'm now that I'm much older, I might have handled it differently is how I would answer that question. Uh, Things to think about. Um, But I would say like in my most recent book, like I've been talking today about um, the process of like coming out for the sixth time to my family or whatever. And um, I'm really close with that family, but we have, I don't know, different experiences of the world and we bicker and argue and we still have a lot of love for each other. And so they, they were fine with me talking about that difficult experience. And when I wrote about it, I think I wrote about like the love that's apparent in that relationship is hopefully apparent in the writing in such a way that, um, that it didn't feel like painful or alienating for them to read it. In the same way I probably felt for my mom to read about the Mother's Day at her house. Does that help? Is that? Yeah, thanks. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, all right, publishing. So um, for memoir, memoir stuff, there's lit mags, there's general interest magazines, and there's books. So um, literary magazines. Does everyone know what a literary magazine is? Or... Um, in Canada, they're, they're kind of like, they're generally quarterlies. They're often associated with universities, but not always. And a lot of them have like long histories in Canada, um, like Prism International at the University of British Columbia is 60 years old now. Um, there's the Fiddlehead, there's Event, there's, there's a lot of them. And the way that submitting to a literary magazine works is uh, you write a piece of memoir, you get it as good as you can get it. It's maybe 2,000 words long or 5,000 words long, and you submit it to them by a submittable usually nowadays. Some of them still take paper only, but I think that's like not many of them. General interest magazines, um, that would be like uh, The Walrus or this magazine or uh, The New Yorker. Um, the way those work is you send them a pitch letter. Um, and I have an example of a pitch letter here um, that I'll talk about in a second. You pitch them, you tell them like what you are hoping to write for them. And then hopefully they say yes. A lot of times they say no. Like you get a lot of no's when you're pitching, but you haven't finished the piece yet. So that's fine. You're just sending kind of ideas with some work behind those ideas. But uh, if they say yes, they might have feedback about what they wanna see in a piece and then you'll continue to do your research and you'll write the piece and then you'll file the piece and you'll go through an editorial process with them. So just to compare, Lit Mag is looking for something that's more or less finished and they're probably not gonna suggest a ton of edits to it. A general interest magazine is looking for something that is a little bit more akin to a collaborative relationship um so there are pros and cons for both of those things so for a literary not, not a literary magazine in the new york or whatever you're pitching you're pitching a concept to them and then they're saying and then they say well maybe we're here for kind of doing that theme next december and you work together or yeah it's more or less like that like okay let's so let's go um you don't write the whole thing and then hopefully buy it exactly yeah you're sending them the the idea in a specific way in the body of an email and then they're saying yes or no and if they say yes they might say we want to make sure you talk about this aspect of things or um 
so you want to see 2,000 words. Yeah, exactly. It's that kind of, you're negotiating that kind of detail. Um, I will, I guess I should read this out because you don't have the handout. Um, I put an example pitch in of something that I wrote. Um, there's a magazine called Briar Patch and they were doing a labor issue. What were they doing? Like labor and parenting? I can't remember. Anyway, um, oh, should I read it out? Yeah, I guess I'll read it out. Hi there, my name is Andrea Bennett and I'm a freelance writer, editor and fact checker. I'm also currently four, four and a half months pregnant. As a freelancer, I won't be able to take parental leave after I give birth, neither will my partner who is a student. Consequently, after a brief post childbirth break, I'll be back to work juggling an infant alongside the needs of my clients and the magazines I work for. I'm currently trying to save up money so I can afford to work less. The irony is given our current economic structure, my attempts to save ahead mean that I make enough temporarily that I need to pay back my student loans and I'll pay more in taxes next March when I have a three month old, both of which cut into the attempt I'm making to create my own sort of parental leave. As Canada relies more and more heavily on freelance labor, people who want to become parents increasingly face this kind of conundrum. As Nicole Cohen, author of Writer's Rights points out, freelance work is piecework. With stagnating freelance rates, the only way to increase income is to increase workload. Some people delay having kids. Others, like my partner and I, decide to have one child, even if circumstances being different, we choose to have two or more. I would like to write a reported piece exploring both the issues facing freelance workers who are parents and the ways in which some of these workers navigate these issues. I've interviewed Nicole Cohen in the past for an article for the Globe and Mail. I plan to interview her again on this topic. I have interviews set up this week with three other freelancers who have worked from home with infants and small children. I will supplement these interviews with secondary research about parental leave and EI for freelancers in Canada. I propose to write this piece at 1500 to 1800 words. A little more about me. I am editor in chief of Maisonneuve and have previously written for The Atlantic, The Walrus, The Globe, blah, blah, blah. Thanks for considering this pitch and let me know if you have any questions, Andrea. Okay, so that's the pitch piece, that's the pitch. Um, uh, and I'll, so- was it successful? Yeah, yes. Um, yeah, this one, yeah, this one was successful. Um, um, so the basic structure of a pitch, um, or sorry, the basics of a pitch are address the letter properly. So um, uh, just at this point in time, it's, it's fine to say like, hello, first name, comma, or hello, first name, last name. You don't have to use honorifics anymore. And it used to drive me, it still does. I don't get the pitches. I don't handle like the general email submission uh, anymore, but it used to drive me bananas when we get an email that was like, dear sirs or something. And there was like not one sir on the masthead. So there, a lot of the stuff that comes from formality isn't totally, anyway, figure out who you're writing to and address them the way they like to be addressed. Um, use a standard font. Um, yeah, I also, every editor dislikes opening up an email and having like a, a mix of like blue and purple and comic sans. And then, I don't know, just keep it like whatever the email hat. These are really standard. You would be surprised how often that crops up and it affects the way someone reads the pitch. Um, those are the very basics. The structure, um, have a compelling opening sentence. Um, this can sometimes be the same opening sentence you're planning to use for your piece. I don't have a compelling opening sentence. Um, well, it's kind of like the, I'm X, I'm also Y. And the, this piece was meant to, mm, anyway, arguably I don't have a compelling opening sentence in mind. I knock myself marks for that. But then you have a concise paragraph or two detailing the topic, the angle, the research and the interviewees and explain how you're gonna have the access you'll need for the interviews if necessary. So you can see that in my piece, right? Like I'm, I've told you the topic, I'm telling you the, the angle is like, I'm experiencing this right now. And so 
I'm telling you about it because it's something that I'm, that it's difficult that I am figuring out for myself. Um, the research and the interviewees, you can see that there and um, explain how the article fits into the magazine. Um, in this case, it was a directed pitch. So it was pretty clear I didn't explain that. Um, if you're cold pitching to an editor, like if you're talking to someone for the very first time, um, you could say like, I really loved uh, so-and-so's piece on, um, oh, I don't even know, um, the feral sheep of Laskidi. And what I'm hoping to do is um, take the same like research approach that that person took, blah, blah. But just demonstrate that you've like read the magazine and that there's something similar that you saw recently or yeah. Or if there's something that is similar and you want to make sure that the editor doesn't think like, oh, we've run this recently, you can explain how your piece is different. And then a concise paragraph detailing why you're the person for the job. So if it's a memoir piece that you're sharing like, okay, what in your experience, um, what in your personal experience has set you up to write this? Um, uh, if you have a long publishing history, then you do the blarty blar that I did. Um, I'm the editor of whatever. I've written for yada yada, most famous magazines I've written for. And then, um, but if you don't have a long publishing history, what you're doing there is, um, so I've also written notes about some like bike related stuff. I worked for a time as a bike mechanic. So I would mention that there, if I'm writing about like X bike topic, I'm gonna say like, I have five years of experience working as a, a bike mechanic at a community shop where blah, blah, blah. So I'm kind of showing how my personal lived experience is going to give me an angle on the topic that will be fresh or interesting or not every person pitching this magazine is gonna have. And then keep the sign off simple. That's again, another thing like don't use Comic Sans. It's very straightforward, but you'd be surprised at how often you get a different quirky ones. Um, yeah. So that's basically how to pitch. Um, I've put two resources in the pitching uh, thingy too. So um, Drew Nellis, who's a former editor-in-chief of Mason of as well, there's an article on maidzeno.org called How to Pitch. Um, and he kind of goes through the process. And then there's the Open Notebooks Pitch Database. So this is a website um, and they have a bunch of successful pitches on that website for the New Yorker, for Outside Magazine, yada, yada. Um, the American magazines that are big and fancy like that tend to prefer longer pitches. If you're pitching somewhere in Canada, uh, kind of want to keep it like the length of my pitch, I would say, is like the longest you'd want to go. People's inboxes are jammed full. <laughs> Do not read. <laughs> they just don't read. Yeah, they don't read very well, which actually... Um, I would say like the, the paragraphs here are maybe even a little long, like chunking into like smaller paragraphs. If someone's skimming, will help them pick up on the details more quickly. Simple technical question. Yeah. Body of the email, yeah. I have, I'm trying to break some, uh, a lot of the journalism in terms we get send them as attachments and I have tried to break them all with that habit because it's just an extra step someone has to take to see the pitch and um, yeah you want to eliminate that extra step unless someone has specifically asked for it the other thing about pitching too is that uh, you want to look at the masthead of a magazine to figure out like what editor is best to pitch to um, a lot of people are on Twitter these days, so you can kind of pay attention to that. You can go check out their Twitter presence to see if they have particular interests that would 
make your piece a good fit for them. So for example, like I've yammered on about liking bicycles. So if someone wanted to pitch the tie a bike related piece, they'd see me yammering on about bicycles or gardening or whatever it is, and probably send that pitch to me because they know that I, that's an area of interest and I'm more likely to say yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, you don't want to send your politics pitch to the food editor or vice versa. They don't know what to do with that. Um, so does each editor have discretion about what they want to, like what pitch they're going to accept? And, and or do they have to pitch your pitch upstairs? Yeah, so um, usually they are talking so sometimes there are like editorial meetings where people will meet up or now on Zoom or whatever, and they'll chat about story ideas. And usually the editor in chief has the final say. Uh, it depends on each place's structure, but that is a good point. Like um, usually the person you're pitching to is then pitching the story themselves. So the more detail you can give them and the more reason you can give them like, oh, we have to publish this story, the easier it will be them for the be for them to make that case to their editor. <laughs> yeah. Um, so one more follow up. Mm -hmm. Would they contact you before? And they and before they, they pitch. Before they pitch up or not? If they have follow up questions, they might do that. Um, if you're new to someone, you want to send them like the best pitch that you can send them. If you have a bit of an experience or a rapport, they're more likely to email back or whatever because they know you've written for them before, so they know what to expect. If you've never written for them before, you generally want to make sure that they don't have to come back to you with follow-up questions. Um, yeah. Anyone else have questions? <laughs> Oh, and then books. Um, yeah, so um, is anyone interested in writing a book? Do you want to know about that process? Well, what, what about for my little kid's book? When, mm -hmm. I guess find a, I guess find a publisher that suits what they're doing. Yeah, um, in Canada, there are two different ways of, of going about doing it. Um, the first way is to find an agent who will shop the book around. And the second way is to approach publishers yourself. Um, if you're writing poetry, no one other than Margaret Atwood and Ruby Carr have agents for poetry in Canada. Um, so you'll be sending that manuscript in yourself. For children's books, book authors, it's pretty evenly split between people who have agents and people who do not. And um, same for fiction. For nonfiction, I think probably a, there's a larger balance of people who have agents. Um, but yeah, uh, I can probably, I could name off the top of my head most of the publishers in Canada uh, because there aren't, there are a lot, but there aren't that many. Um, it's different in the states if you're looking to publish in the states then it, then you kind of need an agent um anyway so so do you send in a sample or yeah so if you want to get an agent um there are, there are a few different agencies in canada there's transatlantic there's westwood there's i can't remember the large third one anyway you look for people who have published books like the book that you want to publish, and then you see who represents them if they have an agent, and then you approach their agent and you you send them a query letter and a sample, um, or they tell you what they want to see. So that's what you send them is, but the the way and then actually that's a really good way to find a publisher too. You look at the books that you like that you think are comparative titles for your book. And then you see who published those books. And then each publisher has their, like what they wanna see in a submission, but it is usually 
a query letter and a, and a sample of the manuscript. Yeah. Um, so you can do it. Yeah, you can do it either way. There are pros and cons. Um, an agent will take a cut of what you make, but an agent will also send your book out to all of the different publishers at the same time that they think could be a fit for the book and they'll handle the business side of it. And um, depending on the publisher, a publisher might give more time to the consideration of stuff that comes in from an agent versus unagented work. Um, hmm. Anyone else have any questions? Yeah, I, th I was just saying this. Um, yeah, if you, um, there aren't that many agents in Canada. The best way to find an agent is to um, look at the books that have been published in Canada that are similar to the one that you want to publish, that you like, and see who represents those authors. Because agents want to represent, they will have like areas that they cover and they'll have like, a, they'll have tastes because they will be able to, you want to be able to, you want to like the book that you are representing and, and so that you can sell it basically. Um, so as a writer, you're looking for someone who's going to be a good, a good match with you and your work. Information is available. Yeah, there are like essentially three large agencies in Canada. There's Transatlantic, Westwood, and one that I'm blanking on. And then there are some smaller ones. But if you look up like book agents in Canada, just Google it, then you'll get the list. And then you can also look to see like if I go to the Transatlantic website or whatever, um, then I can look at each agent and see who their clients are. So um, that is another way of doing it. And you can do it that way too. So you're seeing like, okay, um, this agent represents, um, these three authors I love. So maybe they'd be a good fit for me. And then, yeah, you have to sort of shoot your shot. So you want to make it like the best query and sample that you can. Cause yeah. Then if you say, if they say no, you're that, well, you should have, you should always have for if you want to publish a book or get an agent, you should always have a short list of places that you're excited about or a short list of agents you're excited about. You should never just have one. Yeah. All right. I've been talking for a long time. So, um, and I think that I have, yeah, I've sort of covered everything that I was hoping to cover today. Um, yeah. Um, I know you talk a lot about your experience at the beginning, but like, what, what was your education that launched you into that? And, and like, that exercise at the beginning was amazing, for example. Oh. So, like, where, where would you go, like, after this workshop? So, like, because right away that exercise is like, for so much. Detail. Oh, awesome. Like, so, where, what would the next steps be? Like, I'm expecting you to say you're like a master's degree in like writing or something. Like, so, like, what would you suggest that we do? Or yeah. Do um so yeah there are lots of different ways of going about next steps um personally so what did i do i got a bachelor of arts in french and english and french at the university of guelph and guelph had at that time they didn't have a master's program yet but they had some creative writing courses in the english department um and one of the people who taught there was tom king Thomas King, and he's amazing. And I took a course with him and he sort of like kicked my ass in a really good way. And I was like, oh yeah, this is, I can see, I don't know. I learned a lot of practical stuff from him. Um, and then I worked in communications and I hated it. The, I worked with a lot of lovely people. It was not a good fit for me. So what did, I applied for an MFA in creative writing. And I also applied for um, a fish and wildlife program at a college um, and I got wait, wait listed for the MFA and I thought I was going to go be a fish and wildlife officer and then they let me in and so then yeah I did go do an MFA um, but uh, a lot of the skills I learned there I learned a whole lot about the behind the scenes stuff that was helpful 
because it's really kind of baffling to kind of figure out like, okay, well, here's here are all these books I like reading. How do I become that person? Um, but in terms of the actual like concrete skills, um, you can join like writing workshops, community writing workshops. And even in the MFA, part of what I was, part of what I value was like meeting people who I could ask to be my first readers and give me good feedback on my work. Um, not every feedback piece of feedback you get in a workshop is going to be helpful. And so as the beginning, it's about learning how to discern between what's helpful and not helpful. Cause some stuff, some criticism will be sharp and it'll sting, but it's helpful actually. And some will be sharp and sting and be not helpful at all. Cause that person's never going to be your reader. Um, the other thing you can do is just like when you're reading stuff you like, start analyzing how it works. And if you want to write stuff like it, figuring out how the stuff you like works will help you figure out how to get there. Um, there are different mentorship programs in Canada that are available um, so that you can generally do in a way that's not like school school. And there are optional residency MFAs um, at UBC and at King's College for nonfiction. That's on the East Coast. But actually, there are a couple of people who live in town. Megan Cole, who you mentioned, and Megan's partner, Charlotte. Jason. Yeah, and Charlotte. Yeah. So King, there are a lot, there's some coast to coast connection there uh, with King's on the East Coast. And I'm actually forgetting exactly where it is. The other ocean. Halifax, thank you. <laughs> but uh, where you where everybody's working full time, and then for two or three weeks in the summer they go and do stuff in person. But yeah. Also, this library offers memoir classes mm -hmm. uh, a couple times a year, sort of it's a, a four a four week class or something. And they can get some. So. Yeah, and continuing education courses too can be helpful, um, and like way cheaper and they're designed so that you're doing them at night or whenever and you can learn a lot of concrete skills that way too i've taught a few of those and i would do workshops actually um yeah and then it's yeah much cheaper and easier to do than a whole mfa which i did love doing actually but yeah it's a commitment it's a commitment um does anyone else have any other questions? Yeah, I'm bad at answering this question because I don't like reading books on form and writing. I don't like reading books on writing. Um, but in terms of story structure, what a lot of fiction and nonfiction writers do is they look at the screenwriting books. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, there are a lot of different screenwriting books and then, you know, you don't have to write in a three act structure or you don't have to, but it's helpful to think a uh, story screenwriters will talk about beats and they'll talk about structure a lot, way more than anyway. So screenwriting books, I guess, if you're, if you were wanting to look at story structure, um, what's the one, there's one that everybody loves. That's about, um, story generation. Uh, it has, it's a, it has something called morning pages. It's like a book about how to be creative. The artist's way. The artist's way. Yeah. 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 Everybody loves that. Yes. Everybody. There are lots of people who love that book. Um, I would recommend that. Yeah. Oh, okay. Cool. Sorry. Yeah. I, I'm not, I am more of the school of um, learning through doing. So I have not read the, I think Stephen King has a book on writing the um who's the fellow who runs who's a novelist who's japanese i think yeah i think he has a book on writing and running running and writing that people like i'm sorry i can't give you any first-hand recommendations i should like learn it yet it's a failing as a workshop leader but um yeah, thanks for coming today. Um, if you have questions, you can always email me also. Thank you. And thanks for coming, Kate. And I'll send you the pitching handout.
Oh, thank you so much. Thanks for everything, Andrea. This has been great. You're welcome. Glad. Okay. I also, I also ordered up your book. So oh, thank but, you. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, check it. I'll check out your book also. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. Bye. Bye. Take care. Thanks for the show as well.